we are made to feel secure from the extremes of nature. Of course, this security is a veneer, as thin as spring ice. Jeffrey Stein is a 13-year-old boy who walked out onto thin ice on a Minneapolis lake. He broke through the ice and fell in. The water temperature was about 40 degrees. Two attempts were made to rescue him. One of the rescuers fell through the ice herself. Another couldn't gain a footing on the ice. A boat finally chopped its way through the ice, and the boy was fished from the water. He had been in the icy water about 27 minutes. When he arrived in the emergency department, uh, Jeffrey was really upset. He was awake and talking to us. He still had all of his wet clothes on, and he had blankets covering him at that point. Uh, but the important thing is that I guess he had managed to keep his head out of the water. From what I understand, he was holding on to the ice with his hands, and he kept his head out of the water. So uh, I think that's what, what really saved him. Uh, initially, upon falling into the water, it's a real shocking sensation because the water is so cold um, that it, it, uh, it almost feels like an electric shock, like, wow, this is freezing, you know, and it's very intense. Uh, after that, the body begins to lose sensation, and I've heard people say that, that their arms and legs almost felt like clubs, like they could hardly move them. Um, the next thing that happens is that the person does feel very uh, tired and sleepy, and as the brain is no longer getting uh, enough blood and enough oxygen, the person starts to fall asleep, essentially. In an often chilly world, the human body is pretty inflexible. No matter how cold it is outside, it demands a stable temperature inside, especially for its core, an area that includes the brain, spinal cord, heart, and lungs. The body maintains a core temperature of 98.6 degrees. Temperatures in the rest of the body, limbs, skeleton, and skin, average 98.6 degrees as well, but temperatures in these areas can fluctuate widely without harm. Core temperatures cannot. The core can drop a few degrees for short periods without stress, but when the body can't raise that temperature to a normal level again, it has entered the dangerous state of hypothermia. A person can become hypothermic in cold air, cold water, or even under the influence of certain drugs. But hypothermia strikes quickest in cold water. Water draws warmth away from the body 30 times faster than air. In the United States in 1985 alone, more than 500 people died in waters too cold for prolonged exposure. The dangers of hypothermia are thus a concern for anyone who spends time on the water, whether a work week or a weekend. Yeah. <clears throat> it can even become a sudden reality for those who treat hypothermia victims. Mike Flannery is an emergency room physician with years of experience treating patients with cold stress. Al Lindbergh is an emergency medical technician at the same hospital in St. Paul. They are friends who share an enthusiasm for fitness and outdoor recreation. And in April 1986, they were eagerly awaiting the spring thaw. I know the ice had only been out of the lake for a couple of days, and Al and I wanted to take a, take a paddle. Both of us were interested in canoe racing. We had never paddled together. Uh, it was quite windy, and we really shouldn't have been out there. As we got further out into the bay, we encountered more and more chop. And then suddenly I became aware of the fact that the boat was stern down in the water. And, and the initial shock of the cold was just numbing. It's like all of, my, all of my circuits were depolarized. We initially tried to flip the canoe up. Uh, it takes some teamwork. We had never practiced that either, so we didn't get in. I thought Mike's condition was, you know, very serious. He was still conscious, but as far as, as his strength and uh, endurance and being able to keep afloat, I was real concerned about him. I do remember uh, seeing 
seeing a rowboat being rowed toward us from some distance and and and, and feeling how, uh, some some sense of comfort from that knowing that at least they'd find the bodies once we got to shore um, Mike had to have quite a bit of help to stand and uh, he needed quite a bit of help to walk up into the into the house that we did end up in I'm amazed at the at the power of that cold just experiencing the power of it uh, I think puts me in a position to, to understand better the, the emotional forces that are at play within a patient of mine who's become hypothermic. Al and Mike were lucky enough to have swamped their boat on a populated lake. Ted Capra, a tournament sport fisherman, wasn't so lucky. His accident took place in a large Canadian lake where he and his 15-year-old son found themselves alone in the most precarious position of their lives. And the next thing I knew was the boat sunk. And the only thing that was sticking up was the tip of the boat, which was probably, I don't know, six inches of the boat sticking out of the water. So now we're in this cold water. The water temperature is about 45 to 50 degrees. The wind blowing, it was really cold. And so we were really in a predicament out there. I mean, it was, the water was cold. We were, uh, I, I knew it was just a matter of time. You know, that's what was going through my mind. And so I was trying to really fix it up so that my son uh, was gonna be able to make it. And uh, I really felt as though my son had it under control. He was on top of the boat. If he just hung on to the boat, I thought he would possibly make it. But there was a couple times where uh, I was hanging on to the boat and the waves knocked me off and I was actually going down and my son would grab my hand. I just hold my hand up. I mean, I was on my way down and, and he pulled me back up. And I guess I was just, I was figuring it was just a matter of time. And I kept telling him, uh, you know, what to do, stay with the boat, do this, do that. And he kept telling me, don't worry, we're not in as serious of a problem as you think we are. And it was pretty hard for me to, to comprehend <laughs> when you're sitting out on the middle of Eagle Lake, white caps all over, and somehow between the two of us, we managed to survive, you know. What are the symptoms of hypothermia? The physical stress that Ted and Mike and Al and Jeffrey experienced is the specialty of Dr. Robert Pozos, chairman of the physiology department at the University of Minnesota Medical School in Duluth. He heads a hypothermia research team organized by Sea Grant, a federal program of water research. Their laboratories are the largest inland lake in the world, Lake Superior, and indoors, a test tank that is the coldest bathtub on any college campus. Their focus is the human body and how it keeps itself warm in a cold environment. How are you doing, John? Good, how are you? Good, well, we'll call you. This research involves setting up a kind of mini polar bear club that is, people willing to take a dip in frigid water. The Sea Grant version is a group of volunteers, most of whom are medical students, like John Anderson. For reasons that will become clear, John is a frequent participant in these studies, and the research team has given him the affectionate, if unflattering, nickname, Tuna. The nickname is about as personal as the test gets, for in the lab, John is not so much a friendly face as he is a carefully monitored organism. When John is in the cold water, temperature sensing devices called thermocouples will indicate how cold he is. One will measure his rectal temperature, giving the most accurate reading of his core. Other thermocouples on his back, groin, and fingers will monitor skin temperatures. Once John's pretest body state is checked and recorded, he enters his surrogate Lake Superior, a test tank with water as cold as the surface temperature of the Great Lake in September, 60 degrees. Within seconds of immersion, his nervous system, sensing that his skin is much colder than his core, takes steps to generate and conserve heat. The first of these, a surge of pain from the sudden cold, would normally cause John to leave the water and seek warmth. But John is sacrificing his discomfort for science, so his body must take matters into its own internal hands. The result is a change in physiology monitored by Dr. Larry Whitmers. The physiological changes are there to, one, basically conserve heat, 
and, and two to produce more heat. Now the the production of course you see by the shiver okay shivering is a method of producing heat and so it is the primary heat production method. Uh, the physiological changes to keep heat from leaving the body consists of closing down the blood vessels to the peripheral tissues so that uh, a minimum amount of blood is shunted in through the skin and through the skeletal muscle because um, that blood which is warm from the core if it gets out into the tissue will then lose heat through the skin and through the muscles to the surrounding water the cold environment these internal changes work to prevent a drop in core temperature to those levels where the body becomes less able to help itself if they fail and the body drops below 95 degrees the debilitating effects of the cold become apparent Extreme muscle rigidity makes controlled movements all but impossible. Psychological withdrawal begins as consciousness slips away. The body becomes too cold to shiver, and finally, too cold to sustain normal heart activity. Predicting how the body will react at a particular core temperature is not as tricky as trying to predict how fast that temperature will drop, or whether it will drop at all. Dr. Pozos has selected John for just that reason. John's nickname of tuna was suggested by his large frame and his high percentage of body fat. In cold water, fat, if not beautiful, is at least functional. In John's case, it is functioning so well that after 30 minutes in the tank, he's not shivering at all. And when he leaves the tank, after spending 50 minutes in 60 degree water, his core temperature is the same as it was when he entered. Brian Delage, another medical student volunteer, displays the slim athletic build that, on average, does not fare so well in cold water. Once in the tank, Brian displays the classic symptoms of cold stress that John did not. He is hyperventilating soon after entry, and within minutes, he is shivering violently. Brian is the kind of test subject that Dr. Pozos watches closest of all. For once his internal temperature begins to fall, it can fall rapidly and he must be pulled quickly from the tank. The most carefully studied reaction in this testing is also the most dramatically obvious, shivering. The Duluth lab includes a chamber where the muscular sensations of shivering are monitored. The experience looks worse than it is. For Glenn Andreas, it's just another day at the office, bearable if you bring your sunglasses. An interest in shivering seems appropriate on this cold, wet September day. The hypothermia researchers have left their laboratory to conduct their experiments on Lake Superior. The comforts of an organized lab give way to tangled cords and a moving floor. Dave Israel, a medical student and a hypothermia researcher himself, is the test subject. He's dressed in street clothes and a flotation device to match similar tests in the lab. Where'd you put it, Dave? <laughs> sure was that sleeve. There you go. Beneath the banter, there is tension, especially for Bob Pozos. It seems that with certain individuals, that temperature falls very fast. My concern always is in terms of human subject safety. If you're trying to really simulate people who don't have on life jackets, proper clothing, it's first his safety. We have the same concern here in the tank, you know, but with the, the lake, you just don't have the same uh, ability to monitor heart rate, really talk to the student the same way or the subject. And when you're doing the test without any protective clothing on, it's, it's, it's really very uh, worrisome. Okay, you're kayaking, first time in the spring. On three. One, two, okay. three, go. <laughs> yeah, she's a little nippy out here. Don't smile, Dave. It's not supposed to be fun. It is. It's a What's going on? Big repose or head? Thought by a float, huh? Huh? Where's my? Ooh. 
Dave has been in the water 10 minutes. Dr. Pozos asks him to guess his core temperature. Dave makes a guess that is too high. In fact, the thermocouple on his groin, an area of high heat loss, has shown a temperature drop of some 25 degrees in 10 minutes. Eventually, Dave's core temperature begins edging downward. Then, some 16 minutes into the test, his core temperature plunges. This sudden descent is a classic sign, recognizable at once to the physiologists. Dave's body is losing its struggle with the environment. Bob, take him out of the water. Okay, Dave. Okay. 19 minutes after he went in, Dave is pulled from the water. And even though his core temperature is within the safe range, his rigid muscles won't let him cope with tangled thermocouple wires. But Dave's colleagues have a more important concern now, a phenomenon called afterdrop. Cold blood, pooled in the blood vessels of Dave's extremities, now begins rushing back to his heart. Ironically, escape from the cold is making his core even colder. He is hurried below for warm clothes, warm fluids, and a doctor's examination. Did my temperature go down at all? Yeah, it did. Oh, yeah. Dave's amazing question reveals the insidiousness of hypothermia. He was unaware of his temperature drop and the implication that had his core temperature continued to plunge at the rate of his final few minutes in the water, in an hour, he would have been dead. I'm sure it was a little scarier than uh, being in the tank because, you know, I was drifting away from the boat. And, uh, at the test debriefing, Dave's performance is evaluated. Data from his test and the tests of John and Brian in the lab raise familiar issues about the physical and psychological reactions to cold stress. We've been very curious as to whether the, a human can really perceive how cold they really are. We've just finished some studies up in which we asked that question of kids in the hypothermia tank asking them about how cold do you feel you are relative to rectal temperature or any temperature, how cold do you feel you are? And there's no correlation. My feeling of cold was nothing like what was happening actually in my body. Uh, the, my rectal temperature, my core temperature was falling very quickly. And uh, I didn't know it. I, I was uh, cold, but didn't feel any colder than I was 10 minutes earlier. But apparently, I was getting cold real fast. From our perspective, it seems that there are great individual differences in uh, how people respond to the same cold stimulus. It's somewhat of a perceptual event and uh, may have a good deal to do with survival capacity. So the, certainly, the lab studies we've done seem to indicate that people simply aren't very good judges of how cold they really are. It was real interesting. It was a surprise to me that uh, Dave, because he is such a good athlete, um, dropped so fast. But this seems to be a, a, a rule of thumb that we're running across. Sometimes There's no question that if you're in a situation where you want to generate heat and insulate the, the heat that you generate from the environment, you're going to want a person who's got good muscle mass, a little bit of fat, and an outgoing personality. That's tuna right there. Uh, you take a look at uh, Brian, who's in the tank, tremendously outgoing guy, friendly, intelligent, been involved in all kinds of physical activity, but even the short time of, uh, he was in the tank, he was starting to drop his temperature. Same thing with uh, Dave. Dave is uh, a competitive athlete, uh, competed for the United States Olympics cross-country skiing team, but uh, give me, give me a, a, a boatload of... Uh, have tunas or John Andersons and you know you can, you can conquer Europe. But statistics on those who do or do not survive in cold water have also shown that body type alone cannot predict survivability, a fact well known to Dr. Pozos. We've looked at the human body only as a bag, a 70 kilogram bag of water with a pump that distributes this water. Um, and that's sort of the way I look at it. It makes it simple. But you can't discount the psychology of the person, the psychology of survival, the psychology of being out there saying, well, i got to get this situation in control. How am I going to do it? The $64,000 question probably for me is, when do people give up in the cold? When do people feel that they're, they're at a point where they, uh, uh, they can't continue, they can't survive? We've certainly known about a number of instances, uh, natural disasters, where, where people will fall overboard. Uh, in a roughly the same physical condition, roughly the same body type. Uh, they're all falling into the same cold water, uh, and a large percentage of them perish in the first few minutes. And one wonders how much of that is due to people simply giving up. 
we simply don't have a lot of answers. But I think that sort of will to survive and that coping with the cold uh, and not uh, letting the, the cold defeat you, if you will, has got to be a factor in a lot of those cases that we see. First initial signs of hypothermia, mental disorientation. All right, shiverings are going to be occurring as well in vasoconstriction. Remember that An ongoing project of Sea Grant and the hypothermia team has been to turn research information into public education, whether that means lecturing in a Coast Guard boathouse to paramedics or appearing on national television for a more general audience. But much of their new data still runs up against some old misinformation about survival in cold water. Most people that use boats on Lake Superior are pretty aware, it seems to me, that if you fall overboard, you're, you're gone. If you fall into Lake Superior, you might as well just breathe deep and not fight it because it, you, you're given, what, 15 minutes, 12 minutes, at, 15 minutes at the most, 12 minutes to live? That's a, a grand misconception of, of Lake Superior and a grand misconception of how long you can last in the cold water. Okay, and many times boaters who use Lake Superior say if you fall over you will die within a few minutes uh, or you're gone basically and, and that's, that's just not true. Uh, there are some possibilities of rapid death in the water but they're not due to cold, they'll be due to something else, probably cardiovascular. Uh, or drowning, for example, but not hypothermia. I think the public as a, as a whole really looks upon hypothermia as sort of like a big monster, something out there that is going to get you. Uh, the, the public really needs a much more of a sense of awareness in terms of, look, if you do a lot of common sense things to minimize cold stress and minimize the amount of heat you're going to lose, there's a lot you can do to prevent hypothermia. If you are really a good recreational person who thinks in advance, you're going to have a life jacket with you, you're going to tell people where you're going to be and when you're going to be back. You know, when you recreate, most of us don't want to think about that. I want to go have fun. I've been busy all week worrying about X, Y, and Z. I had a plan for all these things, and now I want to relax. Relax means, one, I don't have to worry about these things. That's wrong. Two, relax means I can take alcohol with me. That's also wrong. The connection between alcohol and hypothermia cannot be overstated. Nationwide, alcohol use figures in more than 50% of all boating deaths. And lab tests have shown that alcohol retards the body's ability to keep the core warm in periods of cold stress. How do you feel? Nice and warm? Any water coming in anywhere? The research of the Sea Grant physiologists is perhaps most keenly followed by manufacturers of personal flotation devices, called PFDs for short, and hypothermia protection gear. Such equipment, like this survival suit, is tested quite rigorously, both in the lake and in the lab. Indeed, science and empirical testing have become the norm for manufacturers of water protection gear. Plants like the Stearns Manufacturing Facility in St. Cloud, Minnesota, are no longer involved in the simple assembly of cork May Wests. Today's materials bear names like polyvinyl chloride and closed cell neoprene and are assaulted by tests. Tear tests, strength tests, abrasion tests, buoyancy tests, and when the units are assembled, still more tests for proper flotation and user efficiency. All flotation devices must, of course, provide adequate flotation. Hypothermia protection is a matter of design and materials and can range from minimal to absolute. But the availability of protective clothing has never been the problem. Stern's executives, Coast Guard personnel, and hypothermia victims themselves point to the larger issues. The statistics show today that about 20% of the boating public wears a PFD. People that go out, they, they don't have the knowledge or they're not ever trained in what hypothermia means, what uh, wearing your life jacket could mean to you, uh, this type of stuff. So boating classes, uh, anything like that, not, not taught to most of the boaters. They just say, well, hey, I've been doing this for all my life, and I don't need to know that stuff. And that's where they run into the bigger problems. I think it's resistance to change, and it's what you grow up with. If you take children and they start wearing PFDs from the time they're knee high or even younger, my observation is they won't get into a boat unless you give them a PFD. 
you know, we make our vests, and, and other, other competitors do too. We make them more comfortable and more stylish, but that encourages the person that doesn't want to wear a PFD in the first place to at least put it on. But if they had started wearing them younger, I think they'd wear them without any reluctance at all, quite frankly. Uh, some people, you know, said, boy, it was really interesting listening to what you had to say, and it made me look at water a little differently, and then there's a lot of them that, you know, no matter what you say to them, ain't going to make any difference, because they're going to go do it their way with no respect to that water, and they're going to, one of these days, find yourself in the position that I was in. Maybe they won't be so lucky, though. That's the only problem. This is not, but this is not an excuse for people to sit back now and say, well, listen, when I fall into Lake Superior, Pozo says it's good to be fat, etc. I'm not saying Bob Pozo sees some hopeful signs for his area of expertise. Society, I think, is interested in hypothermia, very much interested because we're exercising more in the cold. You see runners running outside here in Duluth when it's 10 degrees below zero. And there's cross-country skiing going on, kayaking, tremendous number of activities involving cold air, cold water, and it should be encouraged. Now, if we can just continue to educate the general public as to how they can prevent hypothermia, a lot of common sense kinds of things, I think we're going to be there.